أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الحمد لله الذي له ما في السماوات وما في الأرض وله الحمد في الآخرة وهو الحكيم الخبير والصلاة والسلام على المبعوث إلى كافة الورى بشيرا ونذيرا وداعيا إلى الله بإذنه وسراجا منيرا أبي القاسم محمد وعلى أهل بيته أئمة الهدى ومصابيح الدجا الذين أذهب الله عنهم رجس وطهرهم تطهيرا أما بعد فقد قال الله سبحانه وتعالى في كتابه الكريم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وإذا مرضت فهو يشفين صلوا على محمد وعلى محمد My respected elders, brothers and sisters in Islam, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. As you heard a few moments ago, today's lecture is titled Prophet Isa and Healing the Sick. And inshallah, we will approach this whole topic by addressing the following questions. First of all, what does the Quran and traditions tell us about Nabi Isa ala Nabi'ina wa alihi wa alayhi salam healing the sick? Then we will look at if it's possible for us to be able to heal the sick or not. And if it is, how can we heal the sick? Thirdly, we will examine what rewards and benefits there are for the one who is visited. The sick person who is visited, what benefits do they have? Then we will look at what are the rewards of the one who visits the sick. And then finally, we will look at the etiquettes of visiting the sick. Insha'Allah, we will begin our topic with the loud salawat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. So when we ask the question, what does the Quran and traditions tell us about Nabi Isa alayhi salam, who of course is known as Prophet Jesus in English. What does the Quran and traditions tell us about him healing the sick? When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, just like he did with all of his prophets, he blessed Nabi Isa with those miracles that would be appropriate for the time in which he lived. At the time of Nabi Isa, there were lots of diseases and there was this great need for treatment for these diseases. And therefore, among the miracles that Allah blessed Nabi Isa with were the abilities to cure and heal those who were sick. Not just that, but also to revive the dead. And in fact, Nabi Isa, he uses these Miracles not only to benefit the people, but also to help him establish his status as a prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So in fact, there was this double benefit as there, is the, as there is with these miracles in general, that it not only benefits people at the time, but it also helps to reinforce the position of that person as the Prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, we are told about this in both the Quran and the traditions. First of all, the Quran. Just one example from one of the verses from the Quran about Nabi Isa having these miracles. So, for example, in Surah Ali Imran, verse number 49, he says, Wa ubri'ul akmaha wal absara wa the lepers, I forget the, the term in Arabic, but then he goes on to say, Wa uhyil mawta bi So, wa abrasa, that's it, wa abrasa. So, this means that I heal the blind and the leprous and I revive the dead. So, now, 
In this verse, we are clearly told that Nabi Isa is performing these miracles and at the end he says, Bi'ithnillah, meaning with the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it is very important to bear this in mind that of course all of these miracles were never done on their own being. They were never done on their own accord. It was always with the, with the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So now we are told in the traditions how he managed to do this. The traditions tell us, for example, on some days that thousands of people would gather and they would come to him for them to be cured by Nabi Isa. And in fact, we are told that sometimes if the people were able to, they would go to him. But if they were unable to go to him, he would go to them. Now there's a point here that I will develop later on. Nabi Isa, if the people were, were unable to go to him, he would go to them and he would cure them. So, with regards to this, just one example. We are told in one of the traditions, this is reported in Bihar al-Anwar. I spoke about Bihar al-Anwar in a previous lecture as well. This is a great work for the Shi'i that really we are all indebted to Allama Majlisi who compiled this work. Allama Muhammad Taqi Majlisi, him and his students, it took them over 30 years to compile this great work, which is really a collection of the traditions of the Ahlul Bayt And really it is our greatest work in terms of the quantity of traditions which have been collected in one book. It's 110 volumes of the traditions of the Prophet and his household. So in this work, he tells us about one instance of Nabi Isa curing the ill. This instance involves this lady for, from Canaan and she comes to Prophet Jesus and she says to him that she brings with him his, her paralyzed son and she says to him that can you cure this paralyzed son of me, of mine? And Nabi Isa says to her that, look, I only have the authority to cure those people who are Israelites. And of course, she's from Canaan, so he didn't have the authority to cure her son. But she pleads with him and she asks him very sincerely about curing her son. And so she says to him that, even dogs, they receive the scraps from the tables of their masters. Wow. So I plead to you that you bestow your wisdom on us and you also benefit us as well. So now Nabi Isa, because of her great sincerity, as an exception, he asks Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for permission. Because like I said, he only had permission to cure the Israelites, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grants him permission and then he cures her son. So this is something that is reported not in the Quran but in our traditions. When we put the traditions together with the verses of the Quran, we come with this sort of like holistic picture of Nabi Isa being able to cure the sick in such an effective way. Sallallahu alayhi wa Muhammad wa Muhammad. So that is with regards to him curing the ill and the sick as told to us by verses of the Quran and traditions. Now, the second question we want to address is, can we also cure the sick or not? And if we can, how? Well, in order to examine this in more detail, we are told by Mawla Amir al-Mu'mineen Ali ibn Abi Talib that in fact the Prophet would also cure the sick and this tells us how we can do it as well. So he's, he describes the Prophet in these beautiful words He says that the Prophet was a physician who would go around with his medicine. It's a wonderful description of the Holy Prophet. Tabibun dawarun bitibbe. 
And then he would say that he would make ready his, his ointments and he would heat up his instruments. Then he tells us how he was able to cure the sick and how we could do the same. He says he would take these instruments and he would use them in order to heal those who were blind of heart, those who were deaf in their ears and also those who were dead in their souls. So now this tells us as to how we can do that. Imam Ali goes on to say that he would then pursue and go after those places of negligence and those places of confusion. So what is this telling us? It's telling us that it wasn't just Prophet Isa who would cure the, the sick because it is not just curing the sick who are physically ill, who are physically sick. It is also looking at this whole area in terms of curing people who are spiritually dead. Their hearts are alive physically, but spiritually they are dead. And this we get from Imam Ali Islam in this statement in Nachu Balaga. This is what the Prophet used to do. He used to cure people who were spiritually blind. They were spiritually deaf and their souls were spiritually dead even though physically they had no problems with them. And he would do this with his ointments and his instruments, meaning what? His knowledge, his pure heart, his very truthful character. And this is how we can do the same. Now, what is very important, and I said we'll come back to this point, is how Nabi Isa and Rasul Al-Akram would go after people. They wouldn't just wait for people to come to them. This is really important. We were told in that tradition earlier about Nabi Isa, that if the people were able to, they would go to him in their thousands. But if they were not able to, he would go to them. In this description of Rasul al-Akram, we are told by Imam Ali, that he would go to the places of negligence and confusion and perplexity. So my brothers and sisters, this is telling us an important lesson that it won't be the case that always people will come to us when they want to know something about Islam, when they want to get closer to Allah. In fact, we must take it on ourselves. We must take the initiative to go after them. Just like, Alhamdulillah, I've been hearing some very good things about Mu'mineen and the Jamaat over here as a whole about reaching out to others and of course there's always room for improvement. We can never say that we've done everything and there's, no, there's nothing else we need to do. No, Alhamdulillah, the things are being done. There are very good intentions to do even more and inshallah it really requires commitment from Mu'mineen. Myself and foremost, this applies to because at whatever level we're at, whatever we can do. Nobody can say that they have zero knowledge. Nobody can say that they don't know anything about Islam and they cannot benefit someone else and to guide them a little bit more towards Allah. We all have a level of knowledge and with that comes responsibility to perform our, our responsibilities and our duties as much as we possibly can to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bring them to the religion. Let's take inspiration from the great examples of the prophets mentioned in the Quran as we have been trying to do throughout these nights of the holy month of Ramadan. Let's take inspiration from Nabi Isa and Rasul al-Akram sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And also be tabibun dawarun bi tibbi physicians who go round with their, with their medicine, meaning with their knowledge, with their great character, with their experience, with whatever Allah has blessed them with, and they can use to bring people closer to Him with, inshaAllah. Sallallahu alayhi wa Muhammad wa Muhammad. So now, let's go on to the next question, and that is, what does what are the 
benefits of somebody who is visited. And then inshallah you will see that we are going to try and put forward practical tips and measures as to how we can do some of these things ourselves. Like we've been trying to emphasize on all of these nights, not just the theory, the history, the tafsir, and the looking at traditions, but also practical things that we can implement in our lives as soon as we leave the lecture, inshallah. So, what are the benefits of the person who is visited, first of all? Actually, I came across this amazing piece of research that has been conducted by researchers from Ohio State University. They found that there is a greater recovery rate when the patients are visited by their friends. Mm. Allahu Akbar. So, what this research showed was that when somebody who's had surgery is visited by a friend of theirs, their levels of pain relating to nerve-related issues, nerve-related pain is actually decreased. And their ability to recover from the inflammation that has resulted from their surgery is much faster. Wow. So what they, what they found out, in effect, the science behind it is as follows. When a friend visits someone who is recovering from surgery, that person, that sick person, their stress levels are reduced. When their stress levels are, are reduced, certain proteins in their bodies are also lessened. They, they are reduced as well. And when those certain proteins are at a lower level, this leads to them recovering at a faster rate. Allahu Akbar. This is what is the science behind visiting the sick. So now, they went on to say this very important thing as well. It only applies when you visit the person who is sick in person. It doesn't apply to just sending them a message using social media. You know, often we just quickly send someone a message, hope you get well soon quickly, you know, praying for you, get well soon, all of these things. Sometimes it's an image, whatever the case might be. And that's it. We feel we've done our duty. Well, inshallah, that will be something in the eyes of Allah and we will have done something to help that person. It's perhaps, you know, better than nothing. But the research that was conducted by the Ohio State University pointed to when people visit the sick in person, right there, physically, that's what really lowers the stress levels and the protein and then increases in the ability of that person to recover faster. So you see, my brothers and sisters, this is what Islam teaches us as well. To visit the person who is sick. Let's look at this from a theological perspective. What is happening from the theological aspects of our religion? In fact, we are told that when we visit someone, we are doing what? We are manifesting some very important names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Names such as what? What names can we think of that relate to Allah curing the sick? A Shafi, isn't it? What do we call out to him when we read some of these du'as like Josh and Kabir on those nights of Qadr? And when we, re we supplicated to Allah, what were some of the names that we used to call out to him? And there were names such as a Shafi, meaning, meaning the healer. And Al Mu'afi. What does Mu'afi mean? The bestower of health. So now, what is happening at this deeper spiritual, theological level? Well, when we are visiting the sick, when we are helping those who are ill in any way we can, either it's through visit, visiting them or helping them physically in some other ways or doing things for them, we are actually manifesting. These great names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in our character. We are told, Takhallaku bi akhlaqillah. 
embody the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in your being, meaning those names that can be manifested because there are some that can't be, but those names that are possible to manifest in your character, manifest them. Have the akhlaq of Allah, literally it means that. The khalaqo bi akhlaq Allah means have the akhlaq of Allah, meaning in your character, display godly virtues. Be godly in your character. Nobody can be God, of course. There's only one Allah, but we can manifest up to our very limited levels those attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, inshallah, this is what's happening at that deeper theological level. In fact, what does the Quran tell us about this? We are told that Nabi Ibrahim, ala nabiyyina wa alihi wa alayhi salam, points to this as well. That in Surah Shu'ara, verse number 80, is the verse I recited at the beginning of this lecture. What does he say? He points to the fact that in, indeed it is Allah who is a shafi and mu'afi. It is Allah who cures. But when we say that Nabi Isa also cured, when we say that others also cure, it means that the ultimate and the real curer, the real healer is Allah, but others are just manifesting His names in their being as well. So Nabi Isa acknowledges this when he says, وَإِذَا مَرِثْتُ فَهُوَ يَشْفِينَ When I become ill, then it is He who cures. So you see, my real sisters, we always have to have this strong theological understanding. Whenever we cure, whenever we help others spiritually through our knowledge, or when Nabi Isa, for example, cured, he was doing it by manifesting these great names of Allah, but ultimately it is always Allah who is the originator of all cure. Sallallahu alayhi wa Muhammad wa alayhi Muhammad. So now the next question we posed at the beginning of this lecture that we want to try and address is what rewards are there for those who visit the sick? All of this talk about visiting the sick and helping others, caring for others inshallah as well and enabling them to, re to recover faster. Like we saw even science is saying that. What are the rewards? Well, the rewards are truly amazing. We have a tradition from Rasul al-Akram sallallahu alayhi wa sallam who tells us some amazing rewards. What does he say? He says that on the day of resurrection, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will complain and he will say to the believer that why didn't you visit me when I was ill? Now, what does this mean? Allah is complaining to the mu'min, to the believer on the day of resurrection that why didn't you visit me when I was ill? So then the believer will respond by saying, Subhanaka, Subhanaka, Oh Allah, you are immaculate of all defects. You never get ill. You never feel any pain. What is the response of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? He says to him, yes, but your brother in faith was ill and you did not visit him. Mm. Your brother in faith was ill, but you did not visit him. If you had visited your brother in faith when he was ill, you would have found me near him. And then he goes on to say, and then I would have made it a responsibility for myself to meet all of your needs. Allahu Akbar. This is the reward of visiting someone who's ill. We find Allah next to that person. And then Allah takes it upon Himself to meet all of our needs as well, inshallah. Now, we are also told from a tradition by Imam Muhammad al-Baqir that the one who visits the sick, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala appoints for him an angel 
And that angel will visit him in his grave until the day of resurrection. You see, my brothers and sisters, these are all great rewards for us to visit the sick. It not only benefits the sick person, but actually it comes back to us and it benefits us even more. We think that we are conferring a benefit on that person, isn't it? We think that we are helping that person. Yes, we are. And science, we saw, also tells us the same thing. But it comes back to us even more. We find Allah near that sick person. Allah takes care of our needs. And from this tradition, from the fifth holy imam, Allah appoints for us an angel to be in our grave, to visit us in the grave until the day of resurrection. Allahu Akbar. Not only that, but from Imam Jafru Sadiq sallallahu alayhi wa sallam alayhi. We are told that when someone leaves their home, leaves their place, wherever they are, to visit the sick, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends for them 70,000 angels. Those 70,000 angels accompany that person and they seek forgiveness for that person until that person returns. Allahu Akbar. Just imagine 70,000 angels going with us to visit that sick person. 70,000 angels praying for us, seeking forgiveness for us until the time we come home. These are just some of the benefits, my brothers and sisters, that we gain when we visit the sick. So it is a win-win situation. We win, the sick person wins as well. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Muhammad wa alayhi wa sallam. So now I would like to gradually round off this whole lecture about Nabi Isa and drawing inspiration from his example in the Quran and healing the sick by now finally answering the fifth and final question, and that is, what are the etiquettes of visiting the sick? Like I said, I am always trying to put forward at least some practical things as well, you know, by which we can benefit and implement in our lives, uh, as well as looking at the theoretical aspects and the historical aspects of these stories. So, just a few things that we can do. We are told from the Rasul al-Akram sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that the etiquette and the adab of visiting the sick are as follows. He says that when you visit the sick, establish physical contact with them. Now, there are a number of traditions with regards to this. One tradition tells us that shake hands with that person. Another tradition tells us, put your hand on that person. Then another tradition tells us, put your hand on his arm. And another tradition tells us, put your hand on his hand. In any case, we can say, in a general way, establish some physical contact with that sick person. Next, he tells us, put your hand on their forehead. Now. All of these things we must bear in mind. Sometimes we know the hikmah behind them, we know the wisdom, sometimes we don't know. It should not be the case that we only do things when we know what the hikmah is. This is something I always tell, especially, especially my younger brothers and sisters. It's not always the case. Sometimes through our scholars, our traditions, and through the verses of the Quran, for example, we understand what is the possible wisdom and philosophy behind certain things that we do in our religion. Our religion is full of practices that we do all the time, but we don't always know what the wisdom is. It doesn't matter. As long as we trust in those things, we should do them. And inshallah, always try to find out the wisdom as well as we do those things. But it should not be the case that we only do these things when we know what the wisdom is. Sallallahu alayhi Muhammad wa Muhammad. So the second was to put our hands on their foreheads. Thirdly, we are told in this tradition from Rasul Akram that ask them how they're doing. Okay, it's not just, you know, we turn up there, we don't even ask them how they're doing and 
perhaps just uh, you know eat their chocolates and their fruit, right? It's nothing like that. No, ask them how they're doing. Fourthly, instill hope in them for a long life. This is very important as well, especially if they are of that type of sickness that is quite critical. Instill hope in them. And we are told, fifthly, that ask them to pray for you. Allahu Akbar. Remember in that previous tradition, we learned that Allah is with the sick person. He is near them. And so ask them to pray for you as well. Also, we are told in another tradition from Imam Muhammad al-Baqir that with regards to shaking hands, now this is another practical thing for us all to inshallah implement in our lives. When you shake hands with someone, the Fiqh Imam tells us, prolong your shaking. Don't be the one who, who takes his hand away first. Try to be the one who prolongs the handshake for a longer period of time. For that person who does not take his hand away first and prolongs his handshake is rewarded a greater amount. And even he goes on to say that inshallah Allah will erase the sins between you and that person until there are no sins remaining inshallah. Let's do these practical things in our lives. These are all spiritual gems of wisdom taught to us by those who know the hikmah behind all of these things to the highest level possible. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Just one other little practical thing that we are told this time from Imam Jafar al-Sadiq we are told by the sixth holy imam that in fact when you go to visit someone make your visitation short okay do not prolong your visitation make it short and in fact the first people who are going to thank you for making your visit short are the doctors and the nurses Muhammad wa Muhammad. okay what else can we do with regards to visiting the sick just a few other things to finish off with. Well, we are told that take a gift for that person. Mm. Also, we are told that supplicate to Allah for that person. We are told that definitely pray for that person. Also, we are told that there are certain things that you can do and ask him to consume, him or her. One of those things is Zam Zam water. So Zam Zam water has this benefit of having, you know, this curing ability. And the other thing we are told to do <coughs> is that we give sadaqa on behalf of that person. Give some charity. This inshallah will also help the person to recover better and more quickly. Finally, there's something that we are told that the person can also consume. And of course, you all know what that is. That is the turba of Sayyidu Shuhada Abba Abdullah Hussain Salawatu Allah Wasallam Allah Allah This turba has amazing properties. In fact, when we look at the rulings from a fiqhi perspective, it's so amazing. Even if you have a look at the rulings of His Eminence Sayyidu Sistani, it's there in his works that we are unable, it is haram to consume mud or soil or dirt or sand, right? It is haram, except we are able though, it is jayiz and permitted to consume a little bit of the turba of Imam Hussein alayhi salam for medicinal purposes. This is the benefit of the turba of Sayyidu Shuhada. Now, just in case somebody is wondering how much are we, you know, permitted to consume, Sayyidina Sistani's fatwa is as follows, man, inshallah may Allah protect him and all of our maraja, inshallah. His ruling is that up to the size of an average chickpea, okay, up to that size we are allowed to consume for medicinal purposes, the turba of Imam Hussain alayhi salam. 
Now, just something for us to bear in mind, and inshallah, I'll use this to close this lecture. Not just consuming the turba, but even using the turba in another way. As long as that dirt has an association with Imam Hussein salam, inshallah, it can have this amazing curing property. Let me just tell you this story. It concerns Ayatollah al Uthma, Sayyid Hussein Tabatabai Burujardi. Many of you will have heard of his name, this great Maraja of the past. It is reported that, you know, he had this, this ailment in his eye and it would cause him this great pain. And so one day, it is the day of Ashura, and he, there's this procession, this julos taking place. And you know, sometimes in these Islamic countries in particular, the people who take part in these processions, as a sign of their great mourning for Sayyidu Shohada, they will smear dirt on themselves, isn't it? You might have seen that. They will just smear dirt on them to show that they are in the state of great mourning. Now, Ayatollah Burujardi is watching this procession go by and he sees that one of those mourners, one of those azadar of Sayyidu Shohada has smeared dirt on himself. You know what he does? With the hope, with the hope that this dirt might be able to make his eye better, he takes some of the dirt from this person as he goes past and he smears it over his eye. Immediately that pain in his eye just goes away. Wow. Not just that, but for the rest of his life, he never had that ailment in his eye and he never needed to wear glasses again. Allahu Akbar. Not just the turba of Sayyidu Shuhada from his grave and around his grave, but even dirt that is associated with this great martyr, Sayyidu Shuhada Abba Abdullah Hussein. Salawatullah wa So, as a summary, then, we, today we looked at the story of Nabi Isa and we looked at, in particular, this miracle he had of healing the sick. And we then saw that actually Allah blessed him with all of these miracles because as he did with all the prophets, he blessed prophets with miracles that were appropriate to the time they lived in. And so he was able to revive the dead and cure the blind and heal the leper. And then we saw from traditions also how he was able to do this and we gave an example of this. Then we asked this question, can we also heal the sick? And if so, how? And we answered this by looking at Imam Ali's statement as to how he describes the Holy Prophet. A physician who goes around with his medicine. And how Imam Ali described him as doing this uh, to cure those who are spiritually dead, those who are, have spiritual ailments. And therefore, we also saw how he said the Prophet would go to the people, just like Nabi Isa would sometimes go to the people as well, when they couldn't come to him. This is a lesson for us also to reach out to those who need our help. At whatever level we can, we should help them with our knowledge, and with our experience, with our guidance, with our good character, and bring them closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Nobody can say they are unable to heal the sick, because there are plenty of sick people. We all have an, a, a level of sickness as well. When we talk about spiritual sickness, there's always room for improvement. And so we should reach out to people in our community, to other Muslims, and to non-Muslims as well. So then we looked at how the uh, visiting the sick benefits the person. We saw this research from Ohio State University that tells us that, that science is saying when you visit the sick, it enables them to recover quicker from their surgery. And it only happens when you re visit them in person, not virtually or through social media. 
Then we looked at the rewards of the, per the person who visits the sick. There are these great rewards. And we ended by looking at some of the etiquettes and the adab of visiting the sick, including the great benefits of the turba of Sayyidu Shuhada. Let's pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he enables us to follow in the footsteps of these great prophets that are mentioned in the Quran, inshaAllah. Oh Allah, enable us to heal ourselves and others of sicknesses, inshaAllah. Oh Allah, enable us to live and die with the teachings of the Quran and Yahlu Bayt, alayhi salam. Allahumma shfiq kulla marid, inshaAllah. Oh Allah, there are many people facing difficulty around the world. Grant them relief. And O oh Allah, hasten the appearance of the 12th Holy Imam, Ajjal Allahu Ta'ala Farajul Sharif. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.